Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 753 for November 30th, 2022, and I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Nick of Nick's HomePod Repair. You might remember the article uh, that Steve wrote about his amazing experience with Nick repairing our big girl HomePod, I don't know, like around a month ago. It wasn't just that some guy repaired our HomePod, it was how he did it and how he broadcast live video of the repair as it was happening that it made it so much more interesting. I wanted to know more about how Nick got into doing this and how he creates his videos, so I thought it'd be fun if he came on the show to talk to us all about it. With that, welcome to the show, Nick. Hi, thanks, and it's an honor to be here, actually. Oh, good, good. Well, I got to tell you, Steve just loved everything about the experience with uh, with having you repair it. And it se- seems like a funny thing to be excited about a repair, but the way you do it is so interesting. It was really, really fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and just the, the like seeing that reaction that people get when they get it back and they're like, wow, this is actually working again. And, and then being able to relive that experience that they uh, had with their HomePod and that they enjoy so much. It's It's all worth it. Yeah, well, let's start. I want to get a little background on you. Are you a tech technician or an engineer by trade, or did you just figure it out? What, how how did you get into this? Uh, well, uh, my normal day job is actually a sales engineer, so I, I work a lot with like software and and just basic computer troubleshooting on a day to day basis. Um, but I've always been a sort of tinker in my own free time. Anything, anytime any any of my own stuff breaks or any of my friends' stuff breaks, they usually come to me to you know get it fixed. Um, but I was never really much into actual like micro soldering and like actual board level repair. Um, but I did watch a lot of like Lewis Rossman and Northridge fix and, uh, you know, those kinds of channels. And I always wanted to sort of start up my own kind of repair business, but I, I wasn't really sure exactly how I was going to do it. Uh, I couldn't just like start up a website and say, Hey, I'll fix anything you send in. Right. Uh, Cause there's, there's plenty of people out there. And honestly um, for most things, I feel like people should probably just go to someone with the experience working on your specific thing. Um, if you really uh, like care about it. So uh, what I did to actually get started um, and to sort of build up the confidence into like, feeling like I could actually charge people money for this as a service was I would just go around social media like Reddit and Twitter and look for people that were saying that their stuff, their HomePod was broken. Um, And I would just let them know, hey, if you cover shipping both ways, I'll fix it for you. And uh, yeah, sort of built up the experience from there. And and, uh, yeah. Well, that, that's crazy. Before we get into the details of how you do it and what you do, um, one thing Steve wanted me to ask you about, your website is nixfix.com, and it's really, really well designed. It's it's very Apple-like with these cool animations and graphics. He wanted to know, did you design this yourself? or No, 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 no. So what I actually did was uh, I used uh, this internet tool called the Wayback Machine. I don't know uh-huh. if you've ever used it before. Oh, yeah. Um, I was able to use that to pull up the old version of Apple's original HomePod website back when they uh, originally launched it and sold it and such. And I really liked the original design of that website. Um, There were a few things here and there that they changed throughout that I didn't really like. There wasn't a single version that I liked the whole thing of. So what I actually did was I downloaded a few different versions of the website that I liked basically, and then merged them all into one version and then replaced most of the assets with my own stuff, which is uh, what took about half the time. And then the other half of the time was fixing all the bugs uh, from from the site because it seems like there was a lot of stuff broken in there, which (laughs) that could have been the way that the site was backed up to Wayback Machine or it could have been the way that it originally was. Who knows? I wonder, uh, are you old enough to know what the Wayback Machine comes from, where that name comes from? Uh, No, actually. So there was a cartoon when I was a little kid called uh, Bullwinkle. And uh, oh, on yeah. Bullwinkle, they had a, a guy named Mr. Peabody. And uh, it was kind of like a sub cartoon, like a cartoon within a cartoon. And yeah. he would he had a way back machine where he would travel back in time and go, we would learn about the ancient Romans or whatever as little kids. And uh, that's where it comes from. So that was kind of, kind of a fun little throwback for us old people. <laughs> that's good. So... Apple never had a repair program for the HomePods, which was inexplicable. I mean, everything they make has, that I know of, that they ever made has some kind of repair program. But here we paid all this money for these really cool devices. They were not inexpensive. And yet when they died, they were just, you're done. It's over. 
So how did you figure out how to fix them if Apple apparently was baffled by how to do it? So I actually didn't think that they were any more fixable than most other people at first. Um, but after I bought my first HomePod for myself and I was like, wow, this is awesome. I want more of this, uh, but I don't want to pay full price for it. Cause honestly, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're a fair chunk of change a piece. Right. Um, so I was, I was looking into broken ones to buy for myself as a sort of like cheaper way to get my hands on more of them to try to fix for myself. Okay. Um, so from there I went on to YouTube and, and Google and just searched around for any information I could find on anybody else that's already taken these apart and done any repairs on them. And that's where I found this YouTube video from a channel, I believe called electronics repair school. And they're the ones who, um, took apart, albeit not in the best way, but they, they managed to get a home pot apart and they identified the specific part inside that failed and caused a no power issue. So is that um, what most of the failures are is just simply no power? Yes. And that's, that's what I came to learn after I bought a few broken ones for myself. After seeing that video, I was curious, how common is this actually? Is this, is it the same failure in most of these or not? And sure enough, um, pod after pod that I kept getting with no power, it was usually the same problem. Ah. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, so they they had a way of opening them that you don't approve of, but they did find the root cause, and then you were able to replicate the uh, the the repair that they suggested. Yes, and credit where it's due. I I don't know, but I believe at the time there wasn't really a known way of getting into them very gracefully. So, um, his troubleshooting skills are are far up there with the best so but um i think it was it wasn't for at least a few months after that until somebody else named oh it me nick um put up their own guide on iFixit on how to actually disassemble the home pod without uh destroying it oh okay so that is uh, that's available on iFixit yes so if you look okay. up iFixit home pod info, you'll find two guides on their website. You'll find their original disassembly or their original teardown video, I should say. Their teardown guides aren't disassembly guides. They're, they're teardowns to show you, you know, the guts of the product before every, before anybody else gets their hands on it. Um, and then there's oh, it me next guide on there on how you can actually take the thing apart and uh, be able to put it back together again without any leftover pieces <laughs> or, or a damage. Really, those are those are uh, critical pieces right there. Okay, yes. and I've actually got both of those guides linked within the same paragraph near the top of my website. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So the guide that you pointed to, because Steve said you had posted a guide. That's actually the iFixit guide from Mo at Me Nick. Yep, both of those guides. Um, it's actually I'll pull up my website here. If I go to track forty four. Uh, it says yeah the the first. Uh, set of words there. When HomePod first released, everyone thought total destruction was required. And that's the link to iFixit's first attempt. Okay. And then it says, thanks to Oat Nick's work, that's uh, his guide there. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, so Steve, <laughs> Steve is an electrical engineer with a master's degree, uh, albeit more theoretical t type, uh, type work than technician level work. But, you know, he knows his way around a soldering iron, but yeah. he, he watched you do a repair and he looked at uh, Oatme Nick's guides and he huh? basically said, nope, soldering surface mount parts was a bridge too far even for him. So, I was really hoping this would be a project that would keep him busy and out of my way for months. And that's not how it worked out. He went, Hey, look, I could just pay this really small fee to Nick and he'll do it for me. No, see, it's my first time taking my first home pot apart. It must have taken me a few hours just to get that first piece of plastic off. And I was sweating bullets doing it. Wow. And then I didn't even have a hot air station at the time. I just had a soldering, a plain old soldering iron. And I just wanted to really prove it to myself, like, can I actually fix this or not? And what I ended up doing was not being able to remove the original dead diode off the board um, with my soldering iron. But what I ended up doing was something rather janky was just taking a knife and just sort of like stabbing the diode <laughs> into pieces, breaking oh, the box. because it's already dead. Off. Yeah, I was like, it's already <laughs> broken. So 
Uh, and I was able to confirm with the multimeter beforehand that the diode was in fact shorted out. So I had I had moderate to high hopes that this might actually work. And then I soldered the new diode basically on top of the remnants of the old one with my iron, uh, <laughs> plugged everything in and it, it it fired right up. And I was just out. I was I was oh, it was amazing. It was such an amazing feeling. <laughs> I was immediately like I got to get my hands on more of these and, and see if this is like a common thing or not. And maybe like repair this for other people. I might have just found my niche here. So uh, have you graduated beyond stab it with a knife? <laughs> oh yeah. As soon as I, as soon as I saw that thing power on, I hopped on Amazon and I bought a hot air station so I could uh, do it do it more often without going through that again. What's a hot air station? I've never heard of that. So a hot air station or, or basically just a hot air reflow station or a hot air gun. You you hear people call them different things, but it's essentially just a a mini heat gun. And you oh, have okay. different size nozzles that you can put on the end of it to focus the uh, area of heat that you're putting out uh, of it. And it's temperature controlled and airflow controlled. So you can more or less choose how much you bake your components. Okay. And, and which components you bake. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's important for not frying a whole bunch of other stuff. Right? Exactly. And it's a lot easier using that tool to transfer a lot of heat through uh, the parts than it is with a tiny little soldering iron. You can cover a wider area, especially uh, reaching solder pads that you can't even reach under components that are like surface mounted. Um, oh. you, need, you need hot air to remove a lot of those components. You just can't take a soldering iron and get to some of those parts. Oh, I didn't think about that. I was thinking that you were trying to focus to a smaller area, but you're actually trying to focus on a larger area because you need a couple of things to come undone at the same time. Yep. So if you just purely heat up the diode itself, if you manage to get the heat small enough to just focus on there, you're probably going to have a lot harder time, if at all, ever getting that diode off because the board itself is acting as a heat sink and it's pulling all of that heat oh. and basically sucking it all away from your diode. So you want to sort of get some of the surrounding board area at least a little warm so that way when, you, uh, when you're trying to take it off, it's uh, less, less time with total like intense heat. You want to minimize how much time you're putting your board under heat. Wow, so much goes into just that one piece of the repair is just this little diode. And where did you find the diodes themselves? So they just normal components you can buy yeah, online? They're pretty, buy pretty the bucket standard. Fill? Oh yeah, off the shelf you can get them for around a dollar a piece more or less depending on how many you buy, you can get a discount. I I end up having to buy them like 1 to 200 at a time now. Just so wow. I just so I make sure I don't run out before before, you know, like 10 pods show up in a day. Wow, that's funny. Now, beyond the uh, hot air uh, system, is are there any other specialized tools that you use? Uh, I wouldn't really, I don't think I have any specialized tools at all that I use. Um, the hot air gun is really, I think, the most specialized one. Aside from that, I regularly use the flathead screwdriver to pry <laughs> the basket off. And then I've got the T6 Torx screwdriver for the majority of the screws in the thing, which is, um, might I make the point that it's an interesting, uh, the home pod itself is like a really interesting dichotomy of both repairability and irreparability because they use the same T6 Torx bit throughout all the screws in the thing to get it apart, but then okay. they glue the thing together and then they don't <laughs> let, they don't let you restore the software in them. So if you ever have any software issues with it, it's, it's a, it's a brick. Oh, wow. So do you see any reason why they're glued or, I mean, it's, a, it's not, not like these go through sure. big, vib I mean, they do go through vibration caused they by themselves, uh, but, and but you don't have them on a boat usually or a train or, you know, they sit in a, in a kitchen or something. So what's interesting is the part that they glue together doesn't seem to have any immediate functionality. So it doesn't actually do anything to seal the, the home pod together. Hmm. It seems that all it does is hold that plastic down, that top half of the plastic to the bottom half of the plastic underneath hmm. of it. There's an actual gasket that does the actual job of sealing the, the subwoofer into the pod. So it doesn't leak sound out. So, okay. and I've done a side by side comparison of one with that's never been opened up and one that I've actually cleaned all of the glue out of and put back together again. And there's absolutely no difference. Perhaps yeah. they might be thinking long-term durability, 
maybe <laughs> as that that original rubber gasket fails, they're thinking the silicone adhesive might act as a backup. Maybe huh. they're thinking over time it'll start to build tolerances and start to rattle, so the glue might stop that. I'm not really sure. But so if we get back to the diode, then when we talk about repairability um, or durability, did they just get a bad batch of diodes or is that diode in particular pretty error prone? Like, are we going to be in constant communication once a year we get to send our HomePod to you or what do you think? So unfortunately, I don't really know for certain. Um, it is at the very least a strange coincidence that out of the, the hundreds that have showed up for repair, all of the ones with no power have a date code on the diode uh, between 1746 or 1748K. Uh, that just simply means when the diode was manufactured. Huh. Um, and we've had, you know, again, a few hundred other HomePods in for unrelated issues that powered on just fine. Um, but those diodes have date codes far older or newer than that that continue to work just fine. Oh, so okay. correlation isn't always causation, right? So we got to be careful there before we assume uh, there's a bad batch of those diodes just because we see so many of those fail. Um, because we don't, we simply don't know how many of those diodes in total were used throughout the whole production. Um, mm, right. a, a simple explanation could just be that they used or they had more of those uh, in that date range. So they made more of them with that. So we're going to see more of those ones fail. <laughs> but at it still doesn't really explain why I still haven't seen any of them uh, outside of that date range fail when I see so many of them outside of that date range still. Yeah, yeah. I did want to ask one thing for for the audience that is, that aren't electrical engineers or, or uh, uh, technicians. What does a diode look like? How big is it? Um, so it's roughly about half a centimeter long by a quarter of a centimeter. There, there's diodes. A teeny little thing. Of, yeah, it's teeny it's little. small. It's smaller than your fingernail, like a quarter of the size of your fingernail for sure. Okay. Okay. Just want people to have a, an image in their head of uh, of what it um, what these things look like. So we shipped our uh, the the way your service works. We pay for shipping to and fro. And one of the things Steve was also excited about was you tipped him off to a I guess you tip everybody off to a site called PirateShip.com, and it's a place that shows you the best price to ship the thing you're trying to ship. And if nothing else, that was worth the price of admission because we're always sitting there going, oh, do I really want to go research all these sites and find out the right one? PirateShip.com takes you right there. So we pay to ship it to you. We pay to ship it back. And then, uh, which was pretty inex surprisingly inexpensive because of that site. And then uh, what's what's the repair cost for uh, just the, if it's the diode problem? Yeah. So not just the diode problem, but majority of repairs are $60 flat rate. It doesn't matter how long it takes uh, and to a degree, it doesn't matter what needs to be replaced or repaired on the board or in the pod. The only time repairs are more expensive um, is if the subwoofer speaker needs to be replaced. Uh, some people send theirs in for like bass issues or no bass entirely. And it's a complete toss up. Sometimes the bass speaker is totally fine still and it's uh, reusable and other times um, it's the cause of the no, or it's, it's the, one of the symptoms of the no bases, the speaker itself is actually bad. So, um, that's an extra 20. That's only an extra 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, I try to keep everything reasonable, but I, 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 I try to keep my pricing reasonable such that even for people shipping internationally, it's competitive when you factor in the shipping costs versus paying Apple, um, for an out of warranty replacement, just to to get something with the same potentially faulty parts. Yeah, they, I'm looking up what what did these normally cost three hundred fifty uh, three hundred fifty dollars. I think they were four hundred when they started, but three fifty nine was the last price. And uh, so sixty bucks to replace a three hundred fifty dollar device that is a that is an absolute steal. It's a no brainer. We thought. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and and. Uh, even even if you um, want to go on eBay or Facebook and you see somebody selling like a broken HomePod for an absolute steal, let's say you you pay uh, somebody a hundred dollars even for a broken HomePod, and then that's uh, twenty five to forty bucks in shipping both ways. 
uh, $60 for the repairs, you're still out the door far less than you would be buying a, a working used one in, in, uh, off somebody else or a brand new one from Apple. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. So uh, are there any kind of repairs that you can't do? Like, do you ever get them where you're like, nope, can't fix it? Yes. Unfortunately, um, there's one major sort of umbrella issue that I sort of uh, put a few sub issues under, and that's essentially software issues. So if uh, for whatever reason, the HomePod needs its software restored, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, what's, What's frustrating really is underneath the HomePod's rubber base, there are debug pins and those allow you to connect physically to the HomePod via USB or UART protocol. And what's even more interesting is if you solder a USB cable to those pins and connect it to your computer via a Windows or Mac, iTunes and Finder actually recognize a HomePod is connected. Take it a step further, the UI actually even gives you a button to restore. You click restore and then it says the software could not be found. So all of these HomePods that people get where their power accidentally goes out during a software update or the software update just doesn't go as planned and it it bricks itself. Or you come home from work one day and your your volume buttons are now blinking and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, Unfortunately, it's 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 that close. It's it seems physically possible, but you could taste it. It's so close. There's just no access to the the IPSW file. Uh, that you do happen to currently have access to uh, with pretty much every other Apple product out there, like your iPhones, your Apple Watches, your iPads. All of those have files that you can currently download publicly and uh, use them to restore your device. Even the HomePod Mini, uh, you have access to the files that you need to plug it into your computer and and restore the software. Oh, just not the big home. Just not the big one. I, I huh. kind of understand why they wouldn't allow, like, why it's just not, like, publicly available per se. Um, because, like, for a customer to rip the bottom of the HomePod off, you know, you... And solder on it's, it's, the pins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I could imagine they could have sold an adapter and does, has made a slight alteration to the design in the first place and... and at the very least, the stores could could restore the software on them, but instead they're telling people to go kick a bag of pods. <laughs> hey, so I wonder if under right to repair, there there that could force Apple's hand to release it. That's a good question. So maybe it, I fix it. Could ask for you. <laughs> I thought about I thought about it a lot, and at the end of the day, I can't stop thinking of how Apple can could justify it one way or the other that technically it's as repairable as legally required because there's nothing stopping us from opening it up and doing whatever we physically want to it. Physical. Software wise, um, they can they can continue to to claim that you know there's uh oh, i forget what's the word for it but basically proprietary they don't, or something exactly they don't want their proprietary software and 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 you know goody goods getting out and people making knockoff stuff and reverse engineering it and all that but you can get the ipsw for the ipod homepod mini you can yeah. yes all right it's now my mission in life to find it for you oh. i will never hopefully never need it but i want you to have it i want it to be out there where you you're using it Oh, the, you the, and so many others. I bet. So uh, have you done any repairs on HomePod minis? Uh, I have actually not very many just for myself, but I bought five minis off eBay for, I think like 10 or 20 bucks a piece. It was a lot of them. Uh, mm-hmm. They were all described as won't power on. And uh, I got them. I plugged them into a power brick. None of them showed anything. Uh, and then I plugged them into my MacBook. And they allowed me to restore the software on them, and they all they all worked just fine. Oh wow! Just like that. So oh, that's I, interesting. Yeah, it's it's amazing. So once once you restored the software, then you could plug, plug them into a power brick, and they worked. Yep, they worked just fine. They still work just fine, actually. That was uh, five or six months ago by now. Oh, so that's a hot tip. Go looking on eBay for HomePod Minis that have no uh, that won't power up. 
Hey, if you're willing to take the gamble, 10 or 20 bucks per HomePod mini versus like 40 or 50 bucks at least used per one. That's that's a fun little gamble to me. Yeah. Yeah. That makes me want to go buy some more. I like sprinkling them around the house. I don't yeah. even listen to music, but I've got them all over the place. <laughs> Well, so now that we've gotten into this part, I want to I want to talk about the the way you actually do the repair and and the the hilarious fun thing that you do is you live stream every single repair and you tell people, okay, I'm repairing yours right now, and so you can watch it live and it says Steve's HomePod, and you do this running commentary. How did what made you think to do that? That's just such a fun thing. Well. When I was a little kid, one of my favorite things was going with the, my parents to the mechanic whenever they, uh, or like the tire shop or whatever. And it was really cool to be able to sit in the lobby and watch them working on your car. Okay. And, uh, you yeah. know, that, that was always, that was always really cool. And then fast forward a bunch of years, um, you know, I'm, I'm watching Lewis Rossman and Northridge fix on YouTube, do all these repairs. And, you know, I've always kind of wanted to do something like that. Um, but like I said earlier, I wasn't really sure how I could break into that sort of market uh, and and really get any, any business at all um, because there are already so many other people out there with far more experience than I do fixing a lot of stuff, but not for home pods. So I saw that as an opportunity to... Uh, sort of uh, take over that and fill that that void. I think there's there's something fun about that uh from from the producer's perspective which is what you are in this case. I had did my show um I do a bunch of podcasts but I did them all just solo sitting in front of a microphone for many many years and then somebody said, "Oh, you should do your show live." And I thought, "Well, all right, I'll go I'll just broadcast the creation of the show. It's not the show itself, but it's the creation of the show. And this audience gathered around me and it suddenly became more fun. Every Sunday night, I get to go hang out with these people. I've got friends that are chatting with me and and I, it's a really, really good time. And it changed the nature of producing the show. Every once in a while, I have to do the show without the live audience and it's really lonely and boring and I don't like it. And so I, I imagine maybe it's a little bit like that for you. Oh yeah, I've got, I've got quite a few recurring viewers um, and it's, it's so cool to see people pop in and say, Hey, uh, I started watching like your show now, like every day or, uh, people co- popping in to ask questions about doing their own repairs. I absolutely love helping people if they're doing, if they're, they're working on their own. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. I think Steve's favorite part was when you were working on his, you, you were examining it and you sniffed it and you said, it smells fresh. Is there some kind of story behind that? Uh, not really. Uh, I I just, uh, uh, let's see. Do you just love the smell of electronics? <laughs> yes. I, 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 I really like the smells of a lot of things, I guess. I, I guess that you could say I'm, I'm a little passionate about my, uh, my senses. So, um, okay. but in particular with the, the subwoofer speaker, if it's burnt out, um, well, oh. I'll say this, uh, a bad smelling speaker won't pass, but a good smelling speaker might still not pass. Okay. So if it smells bad, I'm definitely replacing it. Okay. So, um, okay. It's it's always good to sniff that subwoofer. Um, I, I was thinking it, maybe it was it was smokers or something like you got somebody from no, a smoker's oh, no. house like ew. <laughs> no, no. Actually, uh, one of those uh, broken HomePod minis that I got smelled absolutely phenomenal. Um, and sometimes you can I can kind of tell uh, I can kind of guess what room people had their pod in based on the smell. You can Ooh. you can tell if they had it like in the kitchen. Uh, okay. Cause it's, and it also sometimes has a bit of like a greasy, like film on it. Um, mm. And then other times it's got uh, a, like a more like a floral or like a, like a hairspray smell. You know, those came from oh, the yeah, bathroom. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. So you really are checking out. Well, good. I, I guess our kitchen passed muster because it's <laughs> on, on top of the fridge till it, uh, till it croaked on us. That's so funny. How interesting. There, so there was another, um, another video you have, you have a trailer video called, massacre found inside a home pod and we put a link to this in the uh will be in the show notes but it's hilarious describe it and what the heck had happened to that home pod uh so that was one that i had bought for myself off ebay described as obviously for parts of repair not working won't power on uh that when i got it there was no obvious damage on the outside when i cracked it open it had looked like 
somebody had shaken it up with a bunch of like salt water on the inside and let it dry mm. out and corrode. Mm. Uh, once I really got into there, I found the power supplies main capacitor had blown up and mm. leaked its uh, juice or whatever all over the insides and just completely wrecked the whole thing from the inside out. Oh, it is. It, the video is hilarious because it's done at a macro level and he's and he's just traveling along all these all these components and they just look horrible. <laughs> oh, man. As soon as I saw that, that was the music that was playing in my head was this is insane. <laughs> That's great. OK, so when you're doing the repairs, um, you've got multi angle camera shoots. Can you talk about how you do that? Yeah, so uh, I originally started off with just a couple smartphones. I had my iPhone 11 and my Note 8 uh, using an application called DroidCam for OBS. And mm -hmm. uh, I have those all plugged into my machine via USB, and they allow me to use my phone camera uh, as a video source for OBS Studio, which is the software that I use to live stream and record my repairs. Um, so also it's it's a nice little bonus instead of going out and dropping a couple hundred dollars on a USB webcam that's going to give me uh, equal or lesser quality. Why not utilize the pretty decent camera in my in my you know smartphone? So that's what I started off with. And then recently I got myself uh, the Sony ZV E10 for my overhead camera view because uh, I needed something with a more powerful optical zoom and flexibility to zoom in and out of the, the top view desk workspace. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, are you actively changing that while you're, you're working? Yeah. So depending on, you know, how close I want people to be in on from the top view, I will uh, use the physical zoom on the camera, which is just right above the desk. So even with when I'm sitting down, I can reach up there. Uh, and then I've and also then you can got, see in, and then in OBS, uh, which, by the way, is an open source broadcasting application that a lot of podcasters use, um, that's for the audience, uh, They, it, you can see the camera zooming in and out so you can tell what you're doing? Oh, yeah. I've got a monitor okay. right in front of the workspace that shows me real time what, a, what my view looks like. And then I've got a second monitor to the side to see how the YouTube feed is going and the, keeping up with the chat. Okay. Okay. So you're actually watching chat as you're doing this too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's, but you've got a side view too, right? Yes. So um, I've got, uh, imagine the, the arm that you've got for your microphone there, but with a phone mount. I've got about three or four of those mounted around my desk. Uh, so that way I can <sighs> move my phones around at different angles. I've actually got also a piece of glass that sits um, above about six feet above my workspace desk that I've got a bunch of other tools clamped to for uh, anytime I want to stick a camera somewhere and get a specific angle. I like to play with the the video setup and, and tweak it a lot. So that is really fun. So this this uh, glass above you. So is that just a place to leave things and that way you can grab them? Yep, it's a, it's it's a multi-purpose. It's uh, an easy place to grab things. It's where the overhead camera is mounted, and I've got a couple other computers there just as sort of an aesthetic thing. But oh, yeah, that's an interesting idea. I, I'd never thought of something like that. That's that's really cool. Um, you said you do get real time feedback. People are commenting as you as you're streaming the repairs. Oh yeah, no, I and I keep up on the chat as much as I can. People are, you know, they come in and say, "Hey, thanks for the tip. I got my pod fixed uh, thanks to your information." Or they're asking for help. They're stuck on a specific step, or they might have broken something and they're asking for a part for me to send to them. Or uh, they're just saying, "This is fun." Yeah, I think you embody what's what's so fun about the internet. I mean, I, it, people talk all the time about the bad parts, but it's, it, the internet is amazing that there's filled, it's filled with so many people who love what they do and want to share that information. It's not, I just don't run into people that often who are proprietary about what they know. You know, you could say, no, no, I'm not going to teach you anything because I want all the business, but what fun would that be? Right? No, I, I want competition. I'm still waiting for someone within the U.S. to reach out to me and say, hey, would you mind putting me up on your website as a repair partner, perhaps? Oh, uh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I the way I see it, it's, uh, you know, no different for me as it is any other big or small business like cor uh, 
uh, competition is good. And, uh, you know, being like an, like an honest and transparent, like business and just like, there's no sense in withholding anything because the, the harder you try to withhold something, the harder someone else is going to try to get it from you. That's a good point. And by sharing information, you're encouraging other people to share with you. I'm sure if somebody figures something out that would make your life easier, they would let you know. That's the whole point of being alive, isn't it? Is is progressing and making everything easier for everybody else to come. So I love that. I love that. Well, I do want to, I didn't have it in the notes, but I do want to talk about how do you open a HomePod? So all I see is this plastic disc on top and then this netting and then the bottom is stuck on, and then the and the, of course a power cord is hardwired, so you can't replace it. Ah, How do you get them open? So um, you can actually replace the power cable to start. Really? Um, to remove the power cable, just set it on your table, firmly hold it down with one hand, the top of the pod to the table, and then wrap the power cable a few times around your other hand, and then build up a little bit of slack and just yank it right out. And no it'll, way. It'll, yep. And it'll pop it's a, right It's just out. a regular connector? Just a, it's not a standard connector, of course but not. you can hop on eBay or, or wherever you can find spare parts for these things, which isn't very, very many places, but you can buy replacement power cables for these too. And uh, I've huh. been using the same power cable for my repair testing here since I started and it's holding up just fine. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So. I, re- I remember seeing that this netting thing come off was fe- Steve's favorite part. He kept replaying it over and over again for me. So I, you get the, how do you get the plastic piece off the top that's got the buttons? Yeah, so you start with something uh, that you can get a grip, like a flat plastic or metal tool that you can get a nice grip on to cut the adhesive that's holding that top plastic layer oh. on. Okay. Uh, and you don't want to you don't want to use anything to pry that plastic off. What you want to do is cut through the adhesive. Keep going oh, around okay. and cutting through the adhesive until it just gives up and it, and it basically pops off on its own. Uh, oh, okay. That's the biggest mistake that I see people make in uh, resulting in scratching and cracking their their tops. So okay, okay. Just, just keep that keep that pry tool level with the plastic top go around a few times and cut that adhesive off. And then once you get that plastic off, um, it's pretty much T6 screws and a little bit of prying here and there to get the rest of the way in. Um, There's a few screws holding the drawstring tight at the top. It's a drawstring? Yep. Once you take (laughs) those out, uh, the top of the mesh loosens up and you can slide it down towards the bottom of the HomePod, revealing the whole top half of the pod and the screws holding the basket and the subwoofer in and the logic board and all that. So once you're that far uh, and you, you continue taking your screws out, you're at the tough part, which is prying that, that top basket off of the bottom half of the pod. Uh, and that's where you take your flathead and a wedge it in between the subwoofer and the plastic frame and sort of split the two halves apart and break that glue uh, holding mm-hmm. the two together apart. And as I say in the stream, if it doesn't sound like an Xbox 360 when you're taking it apart, you might not be doing it right. Um, <laughs> what do you, what do you mean by that? So uh, the glue can be very strong and it can make some very concerning noises as you're <laughs> as you're opening them up sometimes. It sounds a lot like an Xbox 360 if you've ever taken one of those apart. It sounds no. like you're breaking the thing, but you're really not. It's just the glue... So screaming in death or something (laughs) yeah so once you've gone past the hard part it's all pretty much downhill from there you can unscrew the subwoofer and lift that out you can uh reach in there get the power supply out and then get to the amplifier which is usually where most of your problems are going to be okay wow i I, it really is funny watching that that netting open up it it just it just goes whoosh Oh, it's so, it's so satisfying. Sometimes I make, I make little sound effects like <laughs> it's, 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 it's a satisfying experience to slide it down. And then uh, when you're tightening it up again too, and you pull those drawstrings tight and get it looking factory again, it's always so satisfying. Oh yeah. Ours was a little dented uh, from the way he packed it with the power cord. He had it in the original box, but, but it was a little bit dented and you were like, Oh, let me, let me shape you back the way you're supposed to look like you, like you cared about it. It was, it was pretty funny. Oh yeah. The home pod didn't ask to be a home pod. It just is. So you got to take care of them. <laughs> Nick, this was 
at least twice as fun as I hoped it would be. I, I, I hoped it would be nerdy, but I didn't realize that I would meet somebody who was just such a genuine person. I, I, I'm really uh, happy we had a chance to get together on this. This was awesome. Oh, thank you. And anytime you want me to come back, I'd be more than happy to. Oh, maybe there'll be Q&A. So if people want to find your website one more time, where is it? Uh, you can go to nixfix.com. That's Nick without a K, uh, nixfix.com. Or you can just actually Google HomePod repair and uh, track44.moe slash HomePods will be one of the first results that shows up and you can uh, click on that and it'll take you there. All right. Well, that sounds pretty easy for people. One more time. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I, I hope we don't use need your uh, your work again, but if we do, I know where I'm going to go. There's absolutely no doubt. And I, I suspect you might get some more business from this. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure being on here and an honor again. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chit Chat Across the Pond. Did you notice there weren't any ads in the show? That's because this show is not ad supported. It's supported by you. If you learned something, or maybe you were just entertained, consider contributing to the Podfeet podcast. You can do that by going over to podfeet.com and look for the big red button that says support the show. When you click that button, you're going to find different ways to contribute. If you like to do a one-time donation, you can click the PayPal button. If you want to make a recurring contribution, click the weekly Patreon button. Or another way to contribute is to record a listener contribution. It's a great way to help the No Silicast Ways learn from you. If you want to contact me for any reason, you can email me at allison at podfeet.com and you can follow me on Twitter at podfeet. Maybe you want to talk to other No Silicast Ways. You can do that in our Slack group at podfeet.com slash Slack. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.